All right, so we have some time here to get into some questions, and this is going to be, um, you know, a place where I hope you feel welcome to uh, ask some questions and chat with each other. Um, not just ask me, but but talk, talk to others here. I've got some that have come in via um, the poll everywhere already, so I'm going to start with those. And as you think of questions, get uh, Lexi Yogurt's attention over here, and um, we can also entertain some of those um, live. So first one here is, how do you balance information so that it motivates behavior change and policy activism, but does not overwhelm and immobilize? And this one came in early, and I am going to take a wild guess. It was from one of my colleagues. Um, it sounds very scholarly and um, like somebody has thought about communication a good bit. Um, I'll just say a couple things very quickly. Trust is crucial. It absolutely is unavoidable. Um, if you're going to get anywhere, you have to build it. You have to get to a point where um, you know people can walk together through difficult things. And that isn't something you can just download or drop on somebody. Um, I will also say that there really is no protection fully from facts overwhelming people. Um, in some ways, we need to be overwhelmed by this situation and really take it that seriously. But we also need each other and we need um, counseling. We need uh, others who can help us walk through it and face it gradually and think about the implications. Um, so, um, yeah, storytelling is my most crucial answer to the question, and it's what I'm offering mostly here. So I'm going to jump to number two. What are some considerate stories about limiting population growth? How can we make this a good story? Making room for those already most vulnerable and most harmed. So some of the stories uh, that I mentioned up there do directly mm -hmm. engage um, people in the global south and invite us as Americans to recognize that climate destruction is not a future matter for children or grandchildren and help us to see what life is like in places like Pakistan and India already. Um, and so some of them do that. I will also quickly add that, um, you know, and just to name a couple, for instance, I would especially send this person to uh, Kim Stanley Robinson's Ministry for the Future, which which starts in India and visualizes very graphically the impacts of um, wet bulb temperatures at 40 degrees Celsius or above. Um, the other quick thing I'll note on this one is many people have heard and understand that population growth is a major part of this problem. They're not completely wrong by any means. Um, in my lifetime, we've gone from uh, somewhere around four, five billion people on this earth to over seven and a half. And that's a massive impact. However, I do want to point out that the places where population is growing most rapidly are generally not the places emitting the most. Um, and here I actually will appeal to a quick slide. Uh, if you could pull up, Jeff, um, I have, a, have some ready on a PowerPoint here. Um, there's one that is a bar graph that shows, uh, it should be pretty close to the top of my list there. Um, and uh, yeah, keep going, keep going, there you go. Yeah, go ahead and play that one for us and, and share the screen if you, if you can. It's still sharing, good. Um, what I want you to see is responsibility here because Many Americans have the idea uh, that this is because China and India are growing so fast. This is why we have a problem. But these are global emissions historically. Um, can you click on it, Jeff, so that it plays? Uh, just the center of it. Yeah, I'm not sure it shows the audio. I don't need audio. It doesn't have any. There we go. I'm still good? Yep. So what you see here is as we move across the last 150, 170 years, um, how the situation is dominated by emissions from good old USA. At first, it's Russia in second place. And as you watch us move, I have to turn my head to monitor here. As we get further into the 20th century, you're going to see a shift, uh, especially as we get to the end of the Cold War. Um, 
Yeah. I had a uh, another version of this that I played at two times speed and thought that was the one I had. So what you're seeing now is Russia beginning to drop back and China picking up steam, right? And toward the bottom, you'll see India popping up too. So people would say, hey, this is about China and India growing. Um, they're not completely wrong that there's an issue there, but, but look, that's where we were as of 2021. It's pretty clear who's still way out in front. And when you start thinking in terms of um, per capita emissions, we've got the world absolutely destroyed here in terms of what we do individually and collectively as a people. Um, one more that is up here, um, and then I'll see if uh, Lexi's good. You have some, somebody ready? Good. Um, is technology another possible saving grace? We've hit a point, we can't go back to where we started, but could technological advances give us an out? In a weird twist of irony, could the, these huge tech companies that could be our saviors be a, I assume, a real big reason for our downfall? I'll put it this way. When we talk about something like carbon capture technology, which is the idea that we're going to be able to develop machines on an enormous scale that can suck the air out of the atmosphere and filter it so that it no longer has carbon in it or, or methane and bury that deep into the ground somewhere under rocks in a lockbox, right? Um, those technologies don't exist. They may exist, they're being tested, and I am all for, personally, every effort we can come up with to develop them insofar as they're plausible. At the same time, banking on those things working out is a pretty dangerous um, round of roulette to be playing. Um, and it masks the fact that even in the scenarios that we're imagining where some of those come online in a decade or two, we're still going to have suffered a great deal of, of impacts. Um, one of my last quick points is that one of the tough things to get your head around with climate is that what we do now shapes reality 20, 30, 40 years down the road. And um, therefore what we're going, what we're living now is, is already the result of choices made um, a generation ago. Go ahead, Lexi. We Question from somebody in the audience? Do you have somebody there? I thought we had one ready, sorry. I'll go to another one while you look around, okay? Um, let's see. So, someone writes, Tammy wants the floor. Uh, while you're bringing the mic to Tammy, I'll answer this one quick. I've heard and tried to find stories about people dealing with and preparing for the change that's happening while working toward preventing some things from getting worse. I wonder if we could tell good stories about how people have successfully rebuilt outside of flood or fire zones. Um, yes. Um, look for uh, a label or tag, for instance, um, called solar punk. It is uh, along with cli-fi being used to describe stories that uh, articulate optimistic futures that imagine us making good choices. And um, they are being published left and right. Um, so yes, come to me and I will give you uh, more than, than you have time to read uh, or watch. Go ahead. So you briefly mentioned the term climate justice, that concept. And could you um, elaborate on that a bit? Tell us what you mean by that. You, you kind of talked about the inequality very briefly. Yeah. So who's, who are you talking about exactly? So climate justice or environmental justice, um, which is used more broadly to help us think not just about um, the effects of climate change, but also the fact that there are radical, racial, uh, and national um, corollaries, we'll call them, between where people live and where the good stuff is, or the rough stuff in society. These terms are efforts being utilized across the humanities and social sciences and, and beyond to recognize that it's not a coincidence where a park gets built or where a factory 
or a, um, uh, a production zone gets uh, located. And whether we're looking well back into history, as I know Dr. Werner does in her courses and helps people think about redlining and its impact in American culture in our cities, um, or it's the present, and we're thinking across nation states, um, we are relying as Americans, for instance, on the production of goods in places where people have to live in very difficult conditions in order to produce them. Um, and it's worth centering that, becoming aware of it, making new decisions on that basis and challenging ourselves. What, what does justice mean? And are we responsible for people outside of our immediate contact zones? Are we um, drawing a circle of concern that only includes our family and friends and nearest community? Or do the people that live across a border deserve our care? Do the people that live a generation later deserve our care? Please more. Um, I've got one on here. Uh, well, okay. Um, so this one is uh, from my friend David Banish in the English department. He asks, if the solution is to think an economy not based on growth, what does that look like? Periods in the past with little growth had dramatically reduced standards of living. What consensus is there about how an economic system without growth would function and what kind of politics would be needed to sustain such a no growth vision? Enormous and incredibly important question um, that I'm not even gonna attempt to fully answer here, but just to carve out one little part to give a passionate uh, take on. Um, there is an assumption that is deep in us that is programmed by propaganda that we have all been subjected to for decades now that assumes that the only way we're happy is if quarterly profits for stock market entities are rising, that only if we grow in an S&P 500 kind of sense can we be thriving as people. Some countries have said no. They've developed things like um, gross happiness meters that have attempted to assess how healthy are our people. They've pushed back on the narrative that dirty energy is necessary, that it's somehow cheaper. It's actually now, thankfully, financially far more responsible to invest in clean energy than it is to go down the road of more coal and more natural gas fracking. Um, and that is definitely tipping the conversation by the day towards better decisions. Um, so while this question goes a lot further in asking uh, about uh, an economy not based on growth, that's the biggest thing I wanna throw out there that um, the, we have to get past the assumption to begin with that the technologies are unavailable to us at, at prices that we can't afford. The reality is if we stop pouring our tax money into subsidizing the fossil fuel industry to pretend that the money we're spending to buy gas at the pump is sufficient. Instead, the costs are a lot higher because we're, we're subsidizing that nationally and so are many other nations. If we stop doing that and playing pretend and face our situation more directly, we can very rapidly shift towards something that is better does it mean the elimination of global capitalism? Are we headed towards socialism, that big S, dangerous word? Are we all gonna become Russians? Um, I want to tell you there's a lot of steps in between there and you don't have to worry that regulating industry is somehow anti-capitalist. In fact, it's only in the most, several, most recent several decades that neoliberal capitalism has convinced us all too easily that we can just go without regulations and just trust the wealth will trickle down. That's not going so well, is it? 
you truly believe uh, within 20, 30, 40 years, fix what has taken our country down a hiding hole or what has been a problem for over 300 plus years? If you believe that, why? Do you have an idea of how long it might take? I'm not sure I fully understood you. I'm sorry, I was trying. Yes. 20, 30 years, what, what is it you're asking if I truly believe? Do you believe that we can make a change? Mm. Yeah, I do. I truly believe it. Um, put it this way, there are days. Yeah, and how long will that take? We're not talking about one change, right? We're talking about actually every system that we're part of, every institution. We're not just talking about, you know, we got to change all our cars to electric, right? We're talking about our food ways. We're talking about our, um, our, uh, the, our purchases of goods and our habits and assumptions about uh, supply chain management. We're talking about um, how we elect our leaders and whether or not dark money dominates the situation as successfully as it has been doing. Um, there is no one silver bullet then. And I don't think we're going to, or you're going to wake up, you know, in the year 2050 and go, oh, thank you, Whew. right? I think climate uh, destruction is going to be on your mind for the rest of your life. But I do think we can be living in a much more manageable situation that um, people, look at and go, you know, at least we started realizing and at least we did start changing as opposed to one that is just a hellscape where all bets are off about society. Yeah, you have to ask with the mic. <laughs> we can hear you that way. Okay, um, I wrote down a question, sorry. Please. I don't like public speaking that much. Um, okay. Since America, according to the data um, in the presentation that you made a while ago, is responsible for most of the climate change and the enhanced greenhouse effect. To be exact, roughly 25, 30% of global emissions. Keep going. Okay. Um, should the bulk of solving the climate change problem be done by America? And I also have... Well, this is similar to something that you said a while ago, but many countries believe that since America had the opportunity to advance at the expense of the climate, how should we convince other countries that them wanting to advance at the expense of, at, sorry, at the expense of the climate is not worth it? So this is a great example of an environmental justice question. You are doing this, asking a very similar question to one that I watched a, a young Pakistani American woman ask um, the New York media uh, a couple weeks ago. And she said, in, in short, look, our country is responsible for less than 1% of global emissions. You're telling us that you want us to invest in green technology and spend way more than it would cost for us, at least at the front, front end, to expand um, and move towards your developed nation status. You're gonna help pay for some of that, right? And it's the same question. I think our country has a massive responsibility here to actually fund as we have promised to do so in the Paris Agreement, by the way, and we haven't done it yet. Neither have a lot of other developed nations. A lot of countries have said, oh, you're right. We can't expect um, Pakistan, for instance, to come to the table and take on the responsibility for uh, violence that has been inflicted on them by our country in a kind of slowly exploding, um, you know, form for decades. And we have to pressure our leaders to take that responsibility, I think. What else? Um, oh, Dr. Hamner, Dr. Hamner. Yeah. Um, so, uh, mad scientist here. Yeah. Uh, I recognize you. I, so I have a, uh, one thing uh, that I'd like to ask to, for you to comment on, and then an, another, another thing that's more of a question. So first of all, 
uh, to me, the gist of what you're saying is that we, we need to change how stories are being told in our society at the present, right? And so the people who are telling stories now that most people are consuming do not have the best interests of Spaceship Earth in mind. Can you, can you think of an example in the history of humanity where a seismic shift in the control of storytelling has brought about a change in how uh, society has operated? And um, how do you see that happening at this stage in our history? So the first that pops to mind um, will predate some of the folks in this room. I'm going back to the ancient times here, 1990s, okay? Um, the world discovered, had our scientists tell us, there's this thing called an ozone hole. And everybody's like, huh? Hairspray onto their heads. Wait, wait, what? You're saying that these things that are coming out of this, these chemicals are causing a major problem in the Earth's atmosphere. At that point, we told that story primarily through journalism, through, um, through government, uh, uh, information pieces through active um, revelation of what scientists were saying. And we weren't living in a period of such polarization and suspicion about our scientists. And as a result, within several years, how you put hairspray on your hair changed. We acted pretty quickly. There was a very smooth and quick kind of transition from uh, storytelling to action. The thing that, of course, falls very short about this analogy is that we're not talking about something that is as simple to do as getting hairspray companies to change the chemicals they're using. We're talking about everything change. We're talking about learning anew how to be human with each other, how to eat well, how to transport ourselves well in a way that allows ourselves and our, um, our offspring to continue living in a way we recognize. And so in that sense, I'm gonna say this is unprecedented, um, that scale. Probably the closest thing I can come to would be to talk about how close we came to nuclear war and how storytelling and public information pieces, movies about what World War III could look like did help raise the public's concern and help avert um, some of the possibilities uh, during the Kennedy era, for instance. But that's what's coming to mind off the top of my head. What was part two? Uh, part two was uh, how do you see what kind of shift needs to be uh, to take place in storytelling at the present to bring about the kind of change that you're promoting? So I'm going to give a quick shout out to uh, something called the Good Energy Storybook. If you want to look that up, that website up, um, it's a just a great example of um, people working together to inform Hollywood screenwriters and provide a informed kind of um, checkpoint. Are they telling stories in movies and television and video games that are really consonant with our with our reality? Um, it is beginning to happen. Um, I was part of a, uh, a, a conference, pre-conference symposium in 2011, in which a bunch of us sat around and thought, hmm, wouldn't it be cool if there was a lot of stories about climate change? And those have just multiplied at every single year since then. Um, and in, they're in every medium, in every um, genre one way or another. I'm serious. If you like romance, like you're a romance novel reader, I have a climate change romance novel for you. Okay. Just let me know. Uh, Dr. Werner has a comment. Uh -huh. I have a great example that I remember because I'm older than you. Mm. So when I was a kid back in the dark ages, if you had trash in your car or back then people smoked and had cigarette um, ashtrays, what did we do, Jim? You stop the car and you just dump that crap right there. Or you toss stuff out the window. Yeah, 
And Lady Bird Johnson, President Johnson's wife said, oh, hell no, we're done with that. And we had this thing called the Keep America Beautiful campaign. And by God, it worked and it worked pretty darn quick. Mm -hmm. And it, it's about changing for any intro students that are in here, it's about changing social norms, right? It is now considered very deviant to throw crap out the windows, right? Or to even have, I don't think, I don't think cars have ashtrays anymore. Um, so that's one. You know, and it was large scale in the sense that it wasn't that long after that the, the environmental movement took off. I mean, all these things. That's the other thing is, folks, it doesn't just like something happen. These things build over time. The very same people who designed the stories or the propaganda that made our parents and grandparents or great grandparents, who knows, think that it was actually healthy to smoke a cigarette right? That that's what one should do to relax and be healthier. Um, I mean, people were doing this on airplanes routinely, okay? The same people who designed that public relations strategy are behind the fossil fuel industry's efforts to convince us that everything is just fine, just keep pumping, that, you know, we can afford to put it off a little longer. Their strategy is not even dependent on convincing us that this is a good idea. They just have to convince us that there's doubt, that if it's really just not settled. The scientists don't really know when they do. As long as they can keep us hesitant, is this really a bad idea? We'll just keep on doing what we've been doing and they will keep on raking in the profits. Hello. Hey. Um, so I work with a lot of kids and especially like middle schoolers and high schoolers have a lot of concerns about climate um, and they ask really good questions and they don't always know how to address it. They have a really um, bleak outlook. And so I don't want to be like, you're okay, but I also don't want to like compound on their already kind of depressing outlook. And so mm -hmm. do you have any advice for yeah. that? So I got to quickly comment that this is a huge pleasure. Mara was a student here, and those of you doing LAS, are, you know, can look and go, huh? So this is what it looks like. I don't know how many years later now. Maybe we won't comment on that, but uh, you know, she's back and asking great questions and still learning, and that's something we all need to imagine about our futures that we continue learning. Um, what I would say briefly is that there are two pitfalls to avoid, and it's a constant balancing act to help people e avoid, avoid the two of them. On one side, there is the excessive, I hit you over the head and you are just in this space of endless doom, right? The one where the guy goes to that I explained in the video ends up killing himself. And people really are struggling with climate anxiety and climate despair and counseling programs around the country are beginning to start teaching people to help um, you know, their patients with, with those concerns. On the other end of the spectrum, there is the, you know, I, I'm just gonna take the blue pill, continue to um, eat my steak, even though it's imaginary and matrix reference, anybody uh, not clear there. Um, and, and go on, right? And be happy. Don't worry, be happy. And the reality is that, as I was saying there, we can't afford either of those. We have to get people to live in this space. And this includes young people, um, where they understand that there are a lot of things messed up with the world, that they are going to impact them, and where they recognize that they're not powerless, that they actually do have agency, that they can join with others because it has been youth movements who've had a disproportionate impact so far. Uh, if you look at the Sunrise Movement, if you look at Extinction Rebellion, if you look at some of the other nonprofit organizations that have pushed our country the furthest so far, it's been disproportionately young people who've, who've said, you know, Greta, you're not going to be by yourself. I'm going to join in. So it's hard. It takes relationships. It takes patience. It takes willingness to be honest about our own emotions and, and walk alongside. I see uh, more questions coming in this way. Go ahead. 
take those. Okay. Um, they they pop in and then. Uh, Actually, I'm sorry, it was just somebody upvoting one that I already answered. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay, so I, uh, I, I wonder, actually, I have a question for everybody here. Uh, how many of you saw in the news, and by the way, I get almost 95% of my news through Facebook, <laughs> just for uh, full confession. Look at uh, uh, <laughs> Warner over there. He's about to die on you. <laughs> so, how many of you saw in the news regarding the Hurricane Ian? that went through Florida, where many communities were totally devastated, but there was one community that was uh, survived nearly untouched. Did anybody, you, you saw about that, yeah. right? I heard from students actually on that this week. That's fantastic. So <laughs> no. it, was very, it was a very interesting story and it, 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 um, it brings to the forefront a lot of questions. Um, so one was that, the, so the basis of the story is this community decided that they were going to build a sustainable community in Florida. And that meant be ready for hurricanes where a lot of development in Florida has not or, or ignored the reality of hurricanes and that they're getting more and more severe. So what this community did is they built, they didn't build on the beach, they built 30 miles inland. 20, but yeah. Okay. 30 kilometers. I have to uh, <laughs> correct a physicist at every opportunity. <laughs> Maybe it has 10 mile radius. So the outer edge was uh, 30 miles. <laughs> uh, they, they built uh, all kinds of, like we have on our campus, they, they had a number of uh, depressions or areas where they could have retention of water if there was extra water coming into the community. They put themselves off the grid they create, they develop their own micro grid, micro um, uh, energy uh, production site through uh, solar, which of course is a good thing in Florida um, with backup of natural gas uh, in case of uh, the hurricanes. But uh, they were able to maintain their power. They were able to, they didn't have any additional flooding. They had basically one street light went, was knocked down. Um, and it was, it, it was the brainchild of a former football player which is also very interesting, uh, <laughs> who uh, imagined, you know, that we need to take it, we need to take this stuff seriously and so develop this new kind of community. Um, and that's an interesting story, I think. And it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a story in action of people taking things seriously and um, being innovative and creative. So how do you see that sort of uh, story and that situation fitting in with this changing the overall narrative in regarding climate change. It warms my heart to think of athletes who are not running for um, some role in Georgia um, who are actually contributing positively to a situation. Um, and it certainly is a model for all of us of proactive growth. You can build a place you wanna live that is a community that's interdependent, that thinks ahead and that draws on clean energy and is, expecting these kinds of things. It's adaptation. And we need both mitigation and adaptation in our thinking. So that needs to be scaled up. And we do need to think about uh, a managed retreat on some of our shorelines, our coastal areas. If you ask the US Navy about this, they're going to say, yes, they've been very actively thinking ahead about this and taking it seriously for decades now. Um, and you know, if you know the military, you may think, oh, well, they're full of, you know, people who lean right and vote for red things. But the reality is, you ask them, ask insurance companies and insurers of in insurance companies and watch their actions. They've been uh, moving very rapidly in the last decade or two in this direction. So, yeah, there's a lot of good models to follow that are out there if you just start looking. Okay, so I know there's a lot of concerns about some of the forms of clean energy. Um, so overall, there's like concerns about production and how much the, they're able to produce, mm -hmm. not being able to produce enough. 
And then there's also concerns with like uh, windmills taking up farmland space and solar panels when they um, get used, they have uh, harmful chemicals. So do you think that there's, do you think that we'll be able to adapt these to be better and in time to um, stop climate change or, or, and or do you think we'll be able to find a better solution somewhere along the line? A lot, a lot of good stuff in that question. Um, I'm going to work backwards. We're not going to stop climate change. It's baked into the system already. We could disappear as a species, you know, like a Marvel movie imagines half of us doing, right? And the climate would continue to be impacted by the, uh, the ways we've changed our atmosphere already. It's, that blanket is thickened, and it's going to continue to have effects. It's a matter of how quickly we can stop worsening, thickening that blanket. The rest of um, your question that I wanted to immediately jump to is that question about, do I think that we can utilize technologies like um, you know, these enormous uh, windmill turbines that we see going down I-80, um, and can we upscale them and solar farms, et cetera, at the pace that we need to, given that there are drawbacks. And what I wanna point out there is that um, for every, um, every story that you see out there that emphasizes drawbacks of solar and wind, you poke around a little bit and I bet you will eventually find fossil fuel money promoting that story because it's incredibly important to big oil that we are suspicious of windmills and of of solar. Uh, and they've poured a great deal of money into propaganda that makes us suspicious or hesitant, right? I don't have time to figure that out, so I don't know, so I won't decide. I'll just kind of go, hmm. Um, the reality is that we could set aside an area of Texas, 100 miles by 100 miles, and put nothing but solar there and run the entire country off of it with existing technology today. And I'm talking unused land. Um, the realities are actually far more accessible than many of us can imagine. Um, and states that have invested in these directions and taken leads are seeing massive gains. Ironically, uh, this is kind of delicious to watch as an Iowan, uh, I live across the river and I get to watch a very frustrated um, leadership of the state acknowledged the fact that they lead the nation in wind energy because of their predecessors and that it actually is resulting in massively cheaper energy in Iowa than in many other U.S. states. Um, so all I, all I can say is follow the money, follow the, the story, and, and ask who's behind it, and then go look at countries and states that have invested and how much they're uh, benefiting. And it gets pretty clear pretty quickly uh, what we need to be doing and at a much greater pace. It's feeling kind of like we're at that point where yep. we need some Sarah. I, so. I think are we, um, I think the bagels are gone. The, the fruit has been consumed. Are there still cookies? There's a bit of there's a bit of honey to 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 suck down, <laughs> but I think we're done. So let's give uh, Dr. Hamner a round of applause. Thank you. I will I will quickly say that there is a list of thank yous at the end of that video that was moving around a little bit, and uh, please everybody see. Uh, you know, there's a lot of names out there that helped make this talk happen, and um, I'm grateful to all of them. There is a recording of the presentation that is up on the WIU YouTube channel, yep. correct? Yep. And uh, there is also this recording when uh, the Zoom uh, session itself, including the questions and answers, uh, that will also be recorded and uploaded. Um, and uh, so thank you all for coming, uh, and uh, have a great decade, as Dr. Hamner said. <laughs> All right. Yeah.